Welcome to Peopleverse. I'm your host, Evan Troxell, and I'm an architect. Peopleverse is a show where I talk with people throughout the building industry to unearth authentic stories from interesting people to entertain and inspire. You might have heard of the metaverse. Well, we're doing something different here. In many ways, the building industry is still very much like the Wild West, even in a time when technology and data are abundant. Peopleverse explores the people and the stories behind the projects to remind us why we got into this industry in the first place and to build relationships along the way. This show is brought to you by Tect, and you can learn more about what we're doing to connect the supply and demand sides of the building industry at tech.com. And you can learn more about Peopleverse at peopleverse.fm. In this episode, I welcome David Coral. David is a third generation glazier. I say that, I, I say glazier, but I think you say glazier. Glazier is, is, is most people in the industry say uh, glazier, yeah. Okay, but but you don't want, I, I saw a video that you did. You, we don't want to be confused right. putting glaze on donuts with, <laughs> That's with right. a glazier. Okay, David spent the first 15 years of his career gaining hands-on experience in the glass industry. And armed with that knowledge, in 2015, he joined one of the nation's largest manufacturers of custom shower enclosures as the New England Regional Sales Rep. In 2018, he accepted the position of East Regional Sales Manager following the acquisition of a competitor, and in 2020 was promoted to Director of A&D Relations, which I'll have you tell us what that is in a minute, guiding HMI's Hospitality and Multifamily Division by developing a d facing education and outreach initiatives. David carries his passion and experience with glass into every conversation and hopes to educate, inspire, and start conversations with his LinkedIn audience around the subjects of design, hospitality, and the glass and construction industries. So, David, welcome to the Peopleverse. It's great to see you and uh, to meet you. Great to be here. Thank you. You've actually recently transplanted, right, from the East Coast to the West Coast. So, so a little, some of this information, I mean, one of the things that's kind of invisible to the design professional side is regionality with manufacturers. And so we don't know who we should be talking to based on where projects are located. That's something that we're solving for at Tech by matching up a design professional's inquiry with a rep and a location. But I know for, for some things, and I would assume for like glass, especially like a glass guardrails and things like that, which I know you're, you're really specific on the shower side of things right now, at least, but there's got to be regional parameters that different reps would have different expertise in. Definitely. So with, with HMI, with the division that I'm, um, Kind of over, which is our hospitality and multifamily division. We have um, a central team located in Louisville, Kentucky, that kind of oversees the entire country. Um, that being said, while while Louisville, Kentucky is our main manufacturing headquarters, um, we also have a manufacturing headquarters in Boston and one in Reno. So we kind of have a, a nice spread across the United States, um, mm -hmm. and we do have regional reps in each yeah. of those areas. But for the most part, all of our projects are kind of uh, quarterbacked out of our Louisville, Kentucky location where our national hospitality team is, is located. We then farm it out to whichever, you know, manufacturing location makes the most sense to produce the project. I already feel like we're getting ahead of ourselves, but thank you for that. Um, I just wanted to mention that you are on the West Coast, and if, if people are interested in talking with you that makes sense on the West Coast, then it was worth bringing up. Um, but I would love it if you would share kind of your backstory and where you're coming from, how you got to where you are, and why you're so passionate about the product and the category that you're representing and that you're you're a part of. Yeah, sure. So I, I joke that um, when I was two years old, and this is a true story, but uh, I joke that when I was two years old, I, I knocked a glass bowl off of uh, the kitchen table, and it broke, and I subsequently have a you know one inch long scar in my hand still to this day. And I joke that ever since then, I've just had glass in my veins. Um, <laughs> All right, so you're like Mr. Glass from Unbreakable. <laughs> exactly. But all joking aside, my grandfather started Charlottesville Glass and Mirror in 1952 in Virginia. And um, 
So he's been in, you know, he was in the industry his whole life. My father worked for him. My uncle ended up taking over the company. Um, I worked for that company. I worked for four or five other glass companies over the past, you know, 15 to 17 years um, in a lot of different capacities, uh, starting out at the very, very bottom of the ladder, you know, as a, a laborer, moving up to installer, then to foreman, then to project manager and into sales. So, um, in 2015, you, you touched on it on my introduction, um, I moved over to the manufacturer side of the industry. And, you know, that, that time that I spent in the field was absolutely invaluable for understanding, you know, everything from shower enclosures to commercial glazing systems to skylights to window film, kind of the whole gamut. I had experience with all of it. So um, coming to this side of the business on the sales side of things was just a perfect fit and enabled me to be able to relate um, not only to the glazers, but also to the architects and designers having, you know, had that experience. Yeah, I, I can totally see that. And that, that is a, a huge deal. I think on the architect side, a lot of importance is placed on, you know, a particular role in a firm. But I think if for well-rounded architects to be well-rounded architects, you need experience in construction you need experience in small firms medium firms large firms to kind of round out that perspective of all of these things and be able to talk all of because there's various vocabularies that exist within these these different segments of the profession and the industry and if you can bridge that and you can communicate between those people you can be so much more effective because if you can talk to the installer and the designer and the manufacturer and, and kind of connect all the dots between all of those different things. Uh, that's just an amazing resource to be. Sure. I find myself doing it on a daily basis, you know, whether it's um, visiting a, a hotel where they're having an installation issue or something like that and being able to go out and say, hey, I can see right now this is what's going on. You know, if you just tweak this or that, you know, you can have a successful, a successfully installed project. Or, you know, being able to take that to the architect's office and say, here, if you if you change this one little thing, this minute thing, you're going to save your client thousands of dollars, you know. So it, it definitely is. It's so invaluable to have that. I want to hear what some of those one little things yeah. are, but we'll save that for later. I, I think that those are the kinds of things that we want to reveal some tidbits on this show, because I know yeah. we, we won't be able to cover it all, but those are the things that the value of a relationship with a person like you from a design with a design professional can lead to a 20 minute download being way more effective than a six hour okay. Google search. Right. So those are the kinds of things that I'm, I'm really interested in. And that's why we're building the platform that we are at tech is just to connect the right people sure. at the right time. And the early involvement that you just kind of talked about on a project where you can say, if you tweak this one little thing right before it gets to a later phase exactly. before it gets to construction, you're going to, you're going to, it's going to be a big deal. So that that's, I'm, yeah. I'm glad you brought that up. We're going to put a, a bookmark in that and, and come back to that. So tell us about your product category specifically and your role in that. And you already alluded to your role, but like paint the whole picture here so that people can understand like what your expertise is in. Sure. So our product category is broadly glass, um, Specifically, we primarily manufacture shower enclosures, everything from the semi-frameless kind of lower end. I, I hate to say lower end, but more value end um, all the way up to the frameless, uh, heavy glass, uh, as we call it in the industry, shower enclosures. Um, and then from there, we go into to decorative glass, whether it's digitally printed glass or cast glass um, or different rolled patterns and things like that. Um, that's where we get into doing more... Um, you know, architectural feature glass, whether it's a hotel lobby or a, um, you know, restaurant glass dividers between booths. Um, but primarily our, our category is shower enclosures. And that's what I focus on uh, mostly is the, the hospitality and multifamily side of the business uh, where we're, you know, looking to get specified uh, with the different hotel flags um, with some of the largest multifamily developers and things like that. Like you said, there's a there's a, a whole category here, which is glass. But then there's so many pieces within that. And so so coming at it from an architect's perspective, 
right? Like a, I've got storefront, I've got curtain wall, I've got guardrails, I've got, you know, windows and all the different variations on windows. And then we've got the stuff going on in the showers. And, and I kind of think of it just as the category of glass. But when I want to talk to somebody about curtain wall, I want to talk to somebody different, right? If I want to talk to somebody about shower glass, I want to talk to an expert exactly. in shower glass because you've got so much insight into not only like installation and costs and things like that, but what actually works. I saw a video that you did where you went in, you were staying at a hotel, you were at a conference and you did a little how to, or not, not a how to, uh, an informational video about why that particular design layout installation yes. didn't work well. Uh, do, you, do you know the one that I'm talking about? Yeah, it was a, uh, it was the single splash panel. Uh, it's one of my biggest pet peeves in, in commercial projects. Fine for residential, you know, if it's designed correctly. But yeah, I know exactly the video you're talking about and exactly where I was when I took it. <laughs> so there's like a single splash panel and right. then there's just an opening, no door, right? And and you're, you're, the gist of the video was you're saying, okay, now how, how does this actually work? Like it looks fine. It, it looked great. It looked, you, right. you said, European, right? It does. It, it looks high design. And then when you actually stood in the shower and you're holding your phone and you're doing this little video, it's like when you when you said, what happens when I turn this water on is all this water that's hitting my body is going to go right onto the floor, create a slippage problem potentially. It's going to create a maintenance issue, all of these things that architects are sure. actually very concerned about, right? That we're not just concerned about how it looks. Um, and with a little bit more insight and thought, it's like, oh, that that's right. actually obvious. Like one of my pet peeves about going to a hotel with a single splash panel is the valve is always beyond the splash panel. And so I have to reach in and turn the water Lean on over. and get blasted <laughs> with cold water. And there's no way, like, like what am I yeah. supposed to do? Like, <laughs> I'm just going to get wet and cold and all the water is going to go out onto the floor. This actually just happened to me when I went to yeah. the AIA conference in Chicago. Every day when I took a shower, the entire floor of the bathroom just got a pool on it. And that's got to be a maintenance issue, not only for housekeeping, but for the maintenance of the Absolutely. of the hotel over time. If that's happening in every single room, what a nightmare. Evan, you know, you know commercial construction. I know commercial construction. Nothing is ever level, plumb, perfect, you know. Water will follow the easiest, or the path of least resistance, rather. And, um, you know, we, we want to eliminate the possibility of water getting where it should not go, water where it does not belong. Having a splash panel is, is not a way to accomplish that. Um, and that's, that's one of my biggest things. It's not just a slip and fall issue, like you said. It's, it's a mold issue. It's a... Um, material damage issue, you know, drywall damage, carpet damage. It's all of these things. So another one of the things that I think is is really funny, actually, when it comes to uh, this particular hotel, but it's in every hotel that I stay in, is the little placard that's usually on the sink that says something about the hotel's um, water saving initiative or, you know, uh, trying to reduce the amount of right. laundry that they do. Well, what happens when you take a shower in one of those showers that has a splash panel, water gets all over the floor, you're then grabbing those extra I mean, towels that they're do? trying to there? get you not to, like... <laughs> to use if you don't need it and throwing it down on the floor to mop up this water. So it's like this right. cognitive dissonance, which is, Absolutely. you know, I, I talk a lot about on LinkedIn too, mm. where there's an ideal and then there's reality. Um, so yeah, I could go on, right. I could go on a little a rabbit trail on that for a minute but I, I i love that rabbit hole i i don't think we need to go further down it but it is it it is the this is this is the whole argument of form follows function function follows form and and just because it looks good on paper during the planning stages and the design stages doesn't mean it actually works the next question i want to ask you is you, you talked about kind of these different grades or qualities or you know values and so can you talk about what what those are in your industry so that so that the design professionals can have a better understanding of when they're drawing something, maybe having a little bit more understanding of what that actually could be or, or would cost? So the different grades or qualities um, in shower enclosures, um, it really is is more of a uh, not so much a quality thing. The, the quality is the same. That's the quality of the glass. The safety of the glass is the same. Um, 
it really comes to the thickness of the glass where a lot of that cost comes with. With thicker glass, heavier glass um, requires heavier duty hardware. A lot of the cost in a shower enclosure comes down to the hardware. Um, glass, yes, is expensive and we all know, you know, glass is going up um, even as uh, as recently as last month, uh, one of the largest glass suppliers passed on a very substantial price increase, um, which is normal to see in the industry, um, but not not as substantial as it as it has been recently due to supply chain issues and everything. So, a um, little bit of a rabbit trail, but a lot of the cost comes down to again the thickness of the glass and the hardware required. So, if you're looking at a a a semi frameless door that has a continuous hinge down the side, um, you know, that's going to be more on the value end of things. It's, you know, it's going to be three sixteenths or quarter inch thick glass versus a frameless enclosure, which is going to be three eighths inch thick or half inch thick glass. Um, and like I said, the hardware that goes along with those thicker enclosures is typically solid brass, um, you know, plated in some way um, and just, just a lot more costly. And it obviously just has to be heavier duty because we're talking about a heavier weight to these panels and bracing them and, and you know, that you want them to last for a long time. Absolutely. Right? This is not something that you want to be messing with Yeah, <laughs> because it's, it's not easy to take for a, for a homeowner, especially to take off a, a solid panel shower door no. and put it somewhere safely while they, yeah, you just I don't wouldn't recommend that. that. So these <laughs> things need to last. Yeah. So I, what are the, the, material characteristics that would be good for design professionals to know about glass specifically? Well, I mean, glass is, is one of the most sustainable building materials out there um, due to its infinite recyclability. Um, you know, so that's, that's one of the things that I love about glass is, is that, that exact reason. Is that true for laminated glass as well? I'm just curious. So there are companies now that are, are taking laminated glass and whether it's uh, through a process of melting down the lamination, separating the glass. I don't know exactly how they do it, but yes, they, they can recycle laminated glass now as well. It's more difficult, just like with your regular you know, home recycling. Some things are, are more recyclable than others. Um, but with frameless glass, you know, glass that doesn't have a lamination layer in between, it certainly is, is infinitely recyclable. Another one of the characteristics, though, is, is now with technology that we have, we can digitally print on glass in such a way that, um, you know, to the naked eye, it, it emulates a different product. Um, and what I mean by that is, you know, you could emulate an exotic wood or a, um, a marble, a stone, that through the, the process of harvesting these materials um, in real life it is a very ecologically damaging uh, process. And I, one of the things that I think of is um, like white Carrera marble. Um, I wrote an article recently um, for LinkedIn about this uh, exact thing where um, I had no idea, but the the way that white marble is mined in the Carrera region of Italy, extremely, extremely damaging to the environment, to the town specifically, you would think that that would be one of the richest parts of Italy. It's exactly the opposite. Um, they're, they're now, you know, encroaching into protected uh protected national parks and things like that to, to get this white marble. Um, the mining process is ruining the, the streams and the riverbeds in the town, which is causing flooding issues. I mean, I could go on and on, but uh, one of the great things about glass is now that we can print on it, we can, we can emulate white marble. We can do it in, in such a way that it's on quarter inch or three sixteenths inch thick glass. And so you have a huge weight reduction, um, you know, and things like that. So, there's there's a lot that can be done with glass now that you know we couldn't do 50 years ago, um, and and that's just kind of one of the one of those things. Yeah, you had a a post that I thought was really interesting about printing on glass to make it look like frosted glass, which yes. gave additional benefits of actually being able to clean it. And I'm exactly. laughing, but. That's one of those problems that with frosted glass is like it's the one side of the glass that is frosted is like a fingerprint magnet, especially for someone like me who has like incredibly oily skin, right? It's just like it's so difficult to get that to look like a solid sheet of glass again. Um, so when with this digital printing technology that you're talking about, you can achieve variations on, you know, in addition to the marble that you're talking about, but also a frosted glass look like what other, what are the other kinds of 
looks that you can get and and what are the advantages to using printing instead of the more traditional method yeah so well you you hit on a big one and and one of the things that we are uh, kind of transitioning as a company out of is doing sandblasting um, and the reason for that is now we have a much smarter solution and that's printing um, we can really emulate sandblasted or satin you know there's a there's a lot of terms for it in the industry sandblasting is something completely different but satin acid etched velour you know all of these terms kind of fall under the, the acid etched glass kind of uh, category and you're right, they are a fingerprint magnet. You cannot put them in a place where they're going to get touched or they will look terrible within a week. <laughs> and that's the thing about that kind of glass is everybody wants to touch it because it's just, it's beautiful. Um, right. Some of the other things, though, that we can do with it is there's a very popular look right now in shower enclosures where you have grids on the glass. Um, there are some companies that have achieved that look by actually affixing metal grids to the glass inside and out, which ends up turning into a cleaning nightmare. Um, mm. So we're achieving that look by printing on the glass. And it's a it's an incredibly um, beautiful effect uh, where we can actually, because it's printed, we can, we can add a 3D dimension um, to the glass or to the grids uh, and give them a really, make them look like they're popping off the glass. Another place where we um, will use digital printing is for um, artwork. Um, it, it takes over the need for using applied films. Um, and one of the reasons why this is a better solution than that is applied films have a tendency to bubble and to peel. Um, people want to pick at it when they, when they walk up to it and feel it. And, and, you know, over time it just, it ends up degrading. Um, we recently did a, a mock-up for a wine room here in the Paso Robles area of California where they wanted a, a large vineyard scene across, you know, five or six pieces of glass for the wine tasting room, and they wanted it to look sandblasted. Perfect application for digital printing, mm -hmm. where we can achieve that same look, but in a really, really durable way. Are there co cost savings to that, or is that is it just a, a trade off one way or the other, or, or how does that work? It's more of a, a trade off. I mean, I would say that the cost savings are over the life of the project. Um, so where a applied film might look fine for you know a year or two before mm -hmm. it needs to be replaced uh, depending on you know the traffic of the area and how much it's being touched a digital print is going to last for the lifetime of the glass i didn't mention this but it's the digital printing uses a um, ceramic frit technology okay. so it's essentially it's ground up glass with pigment added to it goes through a huge what looks like a huge inkjet printer and then it gets tempered into the glass in our tempering oven. So it becomes fused with the glass. It's 100% permanent. Um, wow. And it doesn't okay. scratch off or fade or anything like that. I was going to ask about Frit because I definitely have experienced this on commercial projects where we wanted to do a Frit pattern. And it and it was like, you can do whatever you want. We're like, really? Yeah. <laughs> okay. And that's, uh, that's the difficulty that's cool. almost with this technology is people say, what can you do with digital printing? It's like, well, what do you want to do with it? Because that's pretty much the sky's the limit for the most part. You're right. It is kind of like uh, designers have all actually thrive with constraints. And, and as soon as you say, you can do whatever you want, it's like, wow, we could spend a lot of hours <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> doing working on this part of it. So that that's really interesting. And it's great to hear that it, it actually is, uh, like you said, melded into the glass so it, it it is basically tamper proof it's not going to split it's not going to peel it's not going to bubble all those things exactly yeah and so then it, i guess it doesn't kind of matter what side of the glass it's on it doesn't i okay cool no we can we can print on the we can print on the wet side of the shower glass um and and a lot of times we will do that depending on the layout depending on the image um it looks the same from both sides so it, it really doesn't matter um, which side it's on Fantastic. I mean, these are the kinds of insights that as a designer myself, like I just want to know what's possible. And mm -hmm. just by knowing that, okay, I can do whatever I want with this, that just opens up possibilities for when the opportunity presents itself. And otherwise, I'm just working with old information. And right. that old information, like there's been so much innovation in this space. Is Are there any size limitations to this kind of technology? I assume there are if it's going through a printer. Yeah, the the size limitations are basically are based on the printer and on our our tempering ovens and things like that. Um, okay. And I I will I will give you the size limitations that you can put in the in the show notes right now. The the dimensions are slipping my mind, but 
yes, the, the size limitations are basically based on the printer and the machinery that processes the glass. Um, so in, in, I don't think we've run against a, uh, a project that we couldn't, couldn't complete because of a size issue. Either, either because you can tile the image across multiple panes of glass or because right. you know, it's, it's large enough to be able to do it. This actually introduces some design constraints, which is usually great to know up front, and then you can work with them and, and still come up with a solution that, that works. So. Right. All right. I, I have another question about the, the, the glass itself as far as like one of the things that when, when you're doing exteriors, there's the shading coefficients and there's the, the visibility index through the glass and all of those things. Are those issues with interior glass as well, or is that something that doesn't really come up? The performance of the glass doesn't come up whatsoever with interior glass, um, other than uh, how it affects aesthetics. So um, regular clear glass, your, your, what, what would be described as regular clear glass, is actually a very, has a very green tint to it. Um, that green right. tint comes from the iron content in the glass. Um, so there, there are variations in glass types for interior glass and as well as exterior. Um, the differences really are, you know, regular clear or low iron. Uh, low iron is going to have a very high clarity. Um, it's going to, to affect the, the look of whatever is behind it in a very minimal way. Whereas, say, if you put regular clear glass in front of white subway tile, uh, when you're looking through the glass, the, the white subway tile will have a, a slight green tint to it. That's not the case with low iron glass. So um, th those are the only like performance um, or really aesthetic differences with interior yeah. glass. However, there are performance differences um, that, that come more from the manufacturer or the fabricator side. Um, and one of those things that I really uh, harp on the importance of with commercial properties is making sure that you specify SGCC certified glass. SGCC stands for the Safety Glazing um, Council, and it is a, it's basically a third party organization that um, we voluntarily uh, uh, submit our glass to, to have it checked for safety, uh, checked for all of our processes are fully up to their standards. Um, so it, it surpasses what our standards are for tempered glass. Um, a lot of the glass that we see coming from overseas, um, you know, it, it doesn't hold that SGCC certification. And what that can lead to is, you know, you'll, you'll see from time to time uh, a, a shower enclosure spontaneously combusts, we call it, where it, it, it blows up for no apparent reason, not from any, any trauma or, or impact or anything like that. Um, and a lot of that comes down to the quality of the glass. Um, Typically, spontaneous combustions like that are from an inclusion in the glass. An inclusion is a foreign object that's in the glass that shouldn't be there. So when it's mm -hmm. tempered, it's, it's under a lot of stress. And that inclusion with temperature differences in the shower or whatever can just cause the glass to explode. Um, so what this SGCC certification does is it, is it really, really is, it sets the bar very high for quality, but also for the processes of the tempered glass. Um, so, you know, when, when you put that into the specs on a project, um, essentially you're, you're just guaranteeing that your client is going to get a, the safest glass that they can possibly get by a reputable fabricator. That's a great example of the kinds of questions that somebody who's doing specifying should ask. Uh, like, I would love it if there's any other ones that you, that just come to mind immediately that are kind of obvious from your point of view, but not so obvious from a design professional's point of view? Like, what are the questions they should be asking during the process of specifying, designing, anything like that? Well, I, I think that that's a big one. Does it matter where the glass comes from? You know, and, and that's mm -hmm. where, you know, I will usually lead them down that path of the, the SGCC certification. It absolutely does matter where the glass comes from. Um, all glass is not created equal. Um, one of the questions that I wish I were asked more often is how can we deliver the best value for the client's money? Um, you know, designers are focused on design and creating an, an aesthetically and functionally beautiful product, right? But there's a lot of times where uh, if, if you were to change one, excuse me, one small detail, you could end up saving your client thousands. And 
you know, one of those, uh, if you want me to get specific, I can. One of those specific things is a lot of times we will see with shower enclosures, a very small fixed panel up against the wall and then a door hinged off of that fixed panel and then another fixed panel. Um, a lot of times that is done to avoid a towel bar that might be mounted to the wall um, so that when the door opens up, it doesn't hit that towel bar. Um, one of the things that I will always uh, suggest as a VE option is if you can move that towel bar, move the towel bar, maybe integrate it into a handle towel bar combo that's on the door itself. The reason being is when you hinge glass off of another glass panel, two things. That glass panel has to be thicker to accommodate the weight of the glass that's hinging off of it. And also the hardware used to, to accommodate that door swinging off the panel is almost double the cost of hinges that mount directly to the wall. So, mm -hmm. you know, if there's a way to tweak one thing, to save thousands versus, you know, well, you know, we're going to put that towel bar right there because that's where you put towel bars in a bathroom. Well, right. that might be true, but two things. I mean, 90% of the time we see towel bars put behind the door when it opens up. How are you going to reach the towel when the door right. is wide open? <laughs> so that's, right. that's one thing. Um, but it's things like that, Evan, that, that you know, if, if I could get involved early in the process, I could say, who, right there. See that one little detail? Right. Change that and you'll save thousands. One, one of the things you're, you're starting to get into, and you touched on this earlier as well, which is kind of the integration of different products and categories and things like that. And obviously glass is a part of, you know, it's, it's one piece of this larger puzzle. Mm -hmm. What are the other pieces to the puzzle that you're most commonly interfacing with? Obviously there's tile, there's shower pans, there's different methods of waterproofing, there's hardware, like what... What are the things that I think that, you know, just trying to go beyond the glass panels themselves mm -hmm. when you're working with a design professional, what are the things you're pointing out to them in addition to the one that you just mentioned that start to give them insight that they don't have to go searching for because they're dealing with hundreds of products and you're talking about these p two panels right here, an opening panel and a, and a, and a splash panel. What are the, the hints that you can give them to save them time that are right in the area that, that we're already talking about? Um, well, I think one of, one of the things that, that we you know, address very frequently is, is blocking. You know, you mentioned the shower pan, the tile, all that. One of the things that often gets forgotten with shower enclosures is the requirements of having blocking behind that wall substrate. Um, you know, and, and, you know, a lot of times we'll will go out to a project where, you know, there's issues, the, do the doors are sagging, they're falling off or whatever. And the first thing I look for is, is was there adequate blocking behind the wall? Um, they're just substrate. attached to drywall. All right. <laughs> uh, you wouldn't believe how, how often we see that it's, it's oh, tile, wow. it's backer board and a hollow space. Um, that is just, yeah. that's asking for major problems or, you know, they'll have the shower walls with the whatever backer board and then hollow space. And, what ends up happening is that shower door, the weight of that will end up pulling the shower wall away from the drywall. Um, wow. Yeah. And then they come to us going like, what's wrong with your door? It's like, well, it's not, not a problem with the door. It's the problem with what's not behind it. It's just telegraphing to the door and that's what they see. So yeah, I get it. Exactly. Um, you know, another thing is, is standardizing things as much as possible is going to save the most amount of money, you know? So using a standard shower pan, say, uh, rather than doing a tiled floor. Tiled floors are great, and for luxury properties, that may be the direction you want to go, and that's fine. Because we're a domestic manufacturer, we can manufacture, you know, all of the panels custom, um, and that's not a problem. Um, but in, in manufacturing, the more you can standardize things, the better for, for the flow of manufacturing, for lead times, but also for cost. Um, so, you know, that's that's one of the things that I would, I would recommend uh, – doing as much as possible is, is standardize your openings. Um, look at adjustability early on um, rather than products that are, are completely, you know, fixed. Um, you know, we, we manufacture several prod products that are, that have a lot of adjustability without sacrificing the aesthetic uh, of a frameless enclosure, whether that's a, a bypassing, you know, frameless barn door style, uh, which offer probably the most flexibility in, in width openings. Uh, opening widths rather, 
Um, but we also offer some swing doors that have a lot of adjustability in the hinge and in the fixed panel that are going to, uh, you know, just ensure a much smoother project um, long term. I think that's all fantastic information. I know a lot of it's specific to the actual project, right? But yeah. these are kind of bigger picture things that people can hopefully keep in mind right. and that information will, will be available when they need it. Sure. I have some rapid fire questions that I would love to throw over the fence here and 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 have you answer as we start to wrap up here. What are two things architects and design professionals get wrong about your products? There is no such thing as self-cleaning glass. Uh, that's something that we see <laughs> a lot of times in specifications. <laughs> um, really? That's yeah. That's so interesting. That's a That sounds like magic. Well, they'll say we want the self-cleaning glass coating or whatever. You know, it kind of gets lumped in. Um, self-cleaning glass and that, that terminology leads to a lot of misunderstanding about glass coatings, specifically for showers. Um, so if I, could, if I could tell them one thing, there's no such thing as, as self-cleaning glass coatings. There are, however, low-maintenance glass coatings, and I would absolutely stress the use of those in a commercial project. Um, without any type of coating on the glass, the glass is, is actually very porous. If you were to, to zoom into glass at a microscopic level, it looks like you know, peaks and valleys. What these coatings do is essentially they fill in those valleys where the glass is, is, think of it kind of as non-stick. Um, it still has to be cleaned, it still has to be maintained, but a lot of times all that's needed is a, a microfiber and water to clean the glass versus really harsh chemicals to try to keep the glass clean. Um, one of the things that, that I, I think, I won't say the architects and designers get wrong, but one of the things that I would just say is involve me early in the process. The, the earlier I'm involved in the process, the more I can help you. Um, like we talked about, the layout is extremely important and can can be a vast difference in the overall cost of the project. Um, so so the earlier I can be involved and just kind of help guide things along, the better. I love both of those answers. I think that the the first one is great to know. One of the things that I think about when you tell that story is iPhones, right? iPhones have Gorilla Glass, or I, I don't know if it's still Gorilla Glass, but Sapphire Glass. There's a high-end glass, but then they have an oleophobic coating on them to kind of hopefully, at least for a while, until it wears off. In my case, this happens uh, because my skin is so oily, which I mentioned before. Everybody knows so much about me now. Uh, <laughs> that, that, that you know, that nobody wants to see fingerprints all over the glass, right? So right. it really does help until you put it in your pocket uh, 2,000 times and take it out and it wears off. Right. But... Or just through normal use, right? But um, that's that's a big deal, and I think that when we can start to think about those in larger scale products installations, uh, that is a that's a big maintenance saver, like you said. But also, just how does it make the owner feel when they don't right. have to clean their glass with heavy duty chemicals, and how does it make them feel when? their glass just looks great way more of the time than it does otherwise. I think that those are things that should be brought up because from a homeowner's kind of overall satisfaction with the product, those are going to be huge. Absolutely. And I, I tell a story, I actually did a, a LinkedIn video about this. I, I like to make these videos when I'm staying in hotels because they offer, they always offer great, you know, real life examples of, of something that I want to point out. But um, it was a hotel that had been, you know, probably three years since the last remodel and um, the glass already looked terrible. You know, the, the lower third of the glass was mm -hmm. stained, hard water deposits, soap scum. And, um, you know, I, I always want to stress to, to architects and designers, you want to give the best product to your client. Um, you want to ensure that in five years, the client is still saying, these things look, look great. The bathrooms are wonderful. We always get compliments. Um, and, and one of the greatest ways you can do that is by specifying that the glass must have a protective coating on it. Um, that is the, the best way that you can ensure that the glass is going to look beautiful long term. And you, you touched on it already, but these glass coatings are oleophobic and hydrophobic, meaning they repel oil and water, essentially. Um, but, you know, in doing that, they also help to repel the soap scum and all of that type of stuff as well. I love that idea of getting 
involved with you early on the project and it totally makes sense. I think it's, it is self-explanatory, but it doesn't happen enough. And I think one of the things that comes up, at least on the architect side, and I don't know how often reps hear this uh, because I don't necessarily think architects are necessarily totally transparent about this, but there's a lot of baggage, right, with, with sales reps out there who Absolutely. are selling to architects all the time and architects aren't buying anything, right? They're specifying right. it. Um, a lot of times products are getting substituted. A lot of times there's value engineering going on. And through this kind of selling instead of service, that's what we say at Tech. We say service instead of sales. I think you say it a slightly different way. I think you say helpful. Uh, and, and these are the things that I think are the types of interactions that architects need to see actually do happen so that we can overcome that bad baggage. It's not to say there are are not sales reps out there who do exactly the opposite of what we're talking about, but maybe you can speak to, I think that your your LinkedIn videos fill in a lot of the color here, but, but the idea of service instead of sales is so important. And I don't know how many reps hear that, like I said before. Right. Um, I think a lot of reps think that they're doing it, they're doing just fine selling to architects, but that's really on the contractor side. The contractor is the one purchasing the product and they're, they're the ones who are fulfilling the, that part of the pipeline. We want to get the best product in for the solution that we're designing for. And the best way we can do that is by talking to an expert and getting the information that we need when we need it. Maybe you can just speak to that point. Yeah. Well, I, you know, I, I tell those inside our organization all the time, but also, you know, in, in the content I produce, if you're not helping to solve a problem, you don't need to be going into the architect's office. There's not a, there's not a, it is not a place uh, for heavy handed selling. It's not a place for shoving, shoving brochures under the door, you know? Um, and, and that's unfortunately, you know, I think one of the things that hampers the relationship between architects and building product manufacturers is that wariness of, you know, I really do not have the time. I don't have the interest of, of having a, a, you know, salesman approach me and try to twist my arm into buying something that's really self-seeking, right? At the end of the day, um, mm -hmm. salesmen are, are trying to get their products into architects' hands because they're going to benefit from it. Um, so, you know, if, if you're not helping to solve a problem, address an issue, save somebody money, you know, something along those lines, um, I don't think that there's a, a reason to call on an architect or designer. Besides the printing on glass, are there other innovations in the category that design professionals would be interested in hearing about or maybe even surprised by? One thing that I will mention, uh, we are seeing a huge demand for fluted glass or reeded mm -hmm. glass. Um, unfortunately, this glass pattern is being discontinued by most glass manufacturers. Mm -hmm. And just as it's picking up in, in massive, you know, demand. Um, so what we have the capability of doing in house, Evan, is we have a cast glass artist that is, uh, in house that creates patterns. So he's actually working on a fluted glass pattern right now. That's an actual cast glass. Most fluted glass is a is a rolled pattern. Um, with cast glass, you have, you know, the ability to to change patterns because you're you're essentially melting the glass into whatever you put underneath it um, as a mold. So uh, we're working on some really beautiful fluted glass options right now for the the design community, um, and I think it's going to be a big hit because, you know, I I, I attend these events like um, AIA or um, more of the one-on-one -on -one, uh, kind of speed dating events with architects. And um, I am just constantly being asked for fluted glass. Everybody's looking for it. Nobody can find it. So hang in there. We are developing something. Um, I will say that. One of the things that, that you might be surprised to learn about um, glass is that while tempered glass is extremely strong and can withstand blows to the surface without exploding, um, this is a lot. A lot of times, you'll see, you know, on the news, a, a vandal or or something like that throwing a brick at a tempered glass window and it bounces off. Um, that's because the surface of tempered glass is extremely strong. Um, the edges and specifically the corners, though, are very vulnerable. Um, so 
many times you could take a hammer and hit the face of a, a frameless glass door and not break it. Um, however, you take that same hammer and just tap it right on the corner and it'll explode. Um, just one of those strange things about, about tempered glass. Um, unfortunately, it breaks into a million tiny little pieces that, that won't gash you like a regular annealed glass will. But um, probably not something new to most people, but it's, it's an interesting thing that uh, you learn when you're working with glass. Uh, and you're carrying a piece of glass with a suction cup and you all of a sudden are just holding a suction cup and you're like, what the heck happened? And you're like, oh, I hit the tile when I was putting. Oh up, my gosh. You know? Yeah. Yeah. I could totally imagine. And and you, I've seen videos. I, this, these do seem to be kind of viral in, in a sense where somebody's, you know, because of the, the types of people that I follow on Instagram or whatever, they're installing a glass hand railing on a stair and they're tapping very lightly the, the hardware to hold up that panel. And then that last yeah. tap and the whole thing just shatters. Right. <laughs> it's like, yeah. Change. Yeah. yeah. Ouch. That hurts. <laughs> that hurts a lot of people exactly um okay so final question well i actually have two questions the the the, fi the second to yeah. the final question is uh and I, maybe I, i'm guessing i know the answer to this but but i could be wrong is when you're out in a retail experience what is the business that gets glass right when they show it off like there's got to be so many examples of this but there's that's where you really get to see some pretty wild designs on display for lots and lots of people absolutely um so the the business or sector that gets it right, yeah. I would say, yeah. um, uh, we see some really really amazing stuff done with glass in casinos. Um, you know, there's typically big budgets. Uh, there's the the desire to wow, yeah. you know, the the customer. Um, so I would say casinos, um, but also you know boutique and luxury hospitality. Um, these are areas, obviously, I'm, I'm super passionate about the hospitality industry in general, but um, these are areas that, that typically have fun with glass. And, and that's one of the things that we're, we're always, I'm, I'm always wanting to communicate to people is, man, when you think about it early on, you can do so much with glass from like what I told you, you know, material replacement with glass through digital printing, beautiful, you know, light plays with cast glass and you know, just so much that can be done um, when when it's budgeted early on and um, and planned for early on. We have a we have a hashtag that we use in our company. Um, it's hashtag shower first. And the, the idea is that we want architects and designers to think about the shower first and then plan for for, you know, what can be done with the glass. It doesn't have to just be regular clear glass. You know, you can make the shower. The shower really is a canvas that can be a place that you express the vibe of the whole property, either through printing or design, uh, you know, cast patterns or, or whatever. Um, so shower first. Think think about that early on. Are there resources for uh, inspirational imagery, but, uh, you know, layouts? I don't know what else there, there could possibly be, but that you guys offer or that you know of that you could let people know about on the podcast here? Absolutely. Yeah. So our, our blog uh, on our website, uh, hmiglass.com, um, we have a lot of great imagery on there and inspirational imagery and also just kind of case studies and things like that on our blog that show some, you know, some cool stuff that we've done. Um, uh, I, I produce a lot of content on LinkedIn, like you've mentioned, um, and that, that's kind of the main place that people can find uh, what I'm producing out there. Um, but yeah, I would say our website and you know Instagram and things like that are probably the the primary places where where we're going to produce inspirational stuff. I'll put links to those in the in the show notes. I th I think that when when it comes to what's possible and what are the examples of the things you're talking about, that's what I want to see as a designer, so that sure. I can just know what the potential is or what the constraints are for my next design project. And I think like the things that you're talking about are are the next level in what I think most people have is a baseline understanding of this category, right? So final question, what, if you were handed a megaphone, would you say to the building industry? There's so much in our building industry, you're coming at it from a particular perspective. What would you want everybody to know? Increase your budgets. <laughs> <laughs> Glass is expensive. So, <laughs> glass is expensive. Manufacturers have been hit just like everybody else by inflation, and uh, raw material is going up. But how, you know, a lot of times we'll we'll quote a project, you know, six months ago, um, 
And even though on our quote, it says this quote is good for 30 days, you know, in, in six months, they'll come back and say, we're ready to place a, an order for this. And it's like, hold up, we got to requote this at this point, yeah. because there's been a vast change in material cost. And often it's like, well, we can't do that. You guys need to absorb that. And it's like, well, you know, we can absorb only so much right. as a manufacturer. Um, you know, and you, you asked for one thing, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say another. Yep. Again, involve me early in the process. Um, I can help the most when I'm involved early. Um, you know, and, and then the third thing is, is buy local. Obviously, that's, that's a self-serving uh, plea. But I see so often where we are you know, brought in to try to remedy a situation where material was ordered overseas, um, something's broken, or say all of the fixed panels that were ordered from overseas don't fit. We get brought in, you guys are a local manufacturer, can you rush these out? Rush, rush, rush. Yes, we can do that, and we will help with that. However, if we were kind of involved from the beginning, you know, we could have ensured a quick turnaround, fast lead time, and then be there long term to support that project right. with replacement parts that we can turn around in a matter of days, not months. Um, so, you know, those are those are things that I kind of encounter on a on a regular basis that if I had a, a billboard or a megaphone, I would like to share. I'm going to push back on your self-serving comment. I don't think it's self-serving at all. This is the kind of thing that I think is a little bit opaque to the design professional side when it comes to manufacturers. We don't know the regions that you support. This is obviously a big problem that we're, we're, we're taking on at Tect, which I mentioned earlier, yeah. right? The regionality part of it. But for instance, I had a, a, a block manufacturer who was at the association level on the podcast early on and just talking about the differences in mixes by region that I wouldn't know as an architect. Like, I'm going to specify right. this kind of block. And it's like, well, you actually can't get it where your project is because there aren't rocks like that there, right? When it, yeah. when it comes to you and being regional and like, okay, I, you have national coverage, but a lot of reps sure. or manufacturers don't. And, and what I mean by that not being self-serving is you should not be serving the locations that you can't serve like that mm -hmm. by, by finding the local, by us helping connect a design professional to a local, not just for expertise, but also for sourcing the material. It helps mm -hmm. save the environment. It helps really totally. focus on who can do what, where, and be responsive rather than like you're talking about somebody who can't be responsive because they're shipping it from too far away. All of those things matter. And I think I just want to point out, I don't think it's self-serving at all. And if you have national coverage, that's fantastic. That means more people like you're going to be able to help more people. But overall, this is something I think the whole industry needs to be much more aware of is this kind of and, and we're helping solve that problem, just connecting the right people with the right people in the right places. Well, that's that touches on something else that, you know, I actually just posted a, a post on LinkedIn about this, where, again, talking about cognitive dissonance, where, you know, there's these ideals in the architect and, and design world of, you know, sustainability uh, goals or whatever. Um, and so, you know, we hold this this sustainability initiative in one hand, and yet in the other hand, we're ordering everything, you know, from overseas. Um, and, and, you know, I've, I've learned again, when I learn the facts about something, I, I can't unsee it. And the amount of pollution that these super freighters chug into the atmosphere on one trip across the, the Pacific is unreal. Mm -hmm. I mean, one, one of the large uh, container ships in a year produces the same amount of pollution as 50 million cars. Wow. I mean, if that, you know, there's there's 90,000 of these freighters in the world in operation. So I think it to me, like, these are the things that I'm trying to bring to the forefront uh, for the, the design and construction industry. If we say one thing is important to us, we got to back it up by doing it. And, you know, and that that for me is is a great, a great reason to buy local, if nothing else. And, if, and again, the art. The architect isn't necessarily making that decision, but that conversation can be had between the architect and the owner, right? The owner can then decide what's important to them. Right. And I think a lot of times the owner is actually sure. driving that conversation if they want to build sure. a sustainable building, right? And and so we need to have insight into what, 
I think that's a fantastic example. Who else knows out there? Like, of course, there are some people who know, but that's that's an amazing statistic about the pollution. And to be able to convey that information to an owner, it matters and it does make a difference. Well, sure. David, thank you so much for spending the time on Peopleverse today. Absolutely. It's been a fantastic conversation. And I will put links to HMI Glass and your LinkedIn. Is there anywhere else that people can follow along with what you're doing? Our uh, Instagram as well would be a good one to point people to. So we put a lot, a lot of actual install photos and things like that on there for inspiration as well. I will mention too, we do have um, some continuing education um, uh, or a continuing education course on AEC Daily, which I can also give you the link for um, that that kind of dives into shower enclosure design <clears throat> specifically. Great. So that's a good free resource if you need continuing education credits. It's an on-demand class. Great. Again, thank you so much for sharing your insight today. This has been a fantastic conversation, and uh, I hope to talk to you again soon. Awesome. Thank you. Hey, before you go, can you do one thing for me? Hit the like button. It really does help us in the YouTube universe. Watching all the way to the end is probably even more helpful, so thank you for that too. It all adds up and helps more people find the show. These are great ways for you to help spread the word and contribute to the Peopleverse. If you want to help the channel even more, please subscribe and use that red button right down there and turn on the notification bell so that you'll know exactly when the next episode comes out. It's completely free to do so. And finally, do you have something to add to this conversation? If you do, leave a comment. I read all of them. I can't wait to share the next conversation with you. So until then, see you soon.